Good day to everyone, and I guess my voice might be a little bit louder, or it, it'll be different today. No, I, I don't notice any difference because maybe I'm not hearing the recorded uh, or the, the the produced video. Yeah, because I have these headphones on, so it's kind of hard to um, regulate the level of my voice. Because, um, like, you know. How high you make your voice is depending on what you hear, and since yeah. my ears are covered, uh, which I had to do because uh, of the new mic that I'm using right now, it's I needed to use this headphone so that your sound on the video will be good. Uh, so I, I guess excuse me for that if that if the voice is too loud. But anyways, um, today is Wednesday, May 26, 2000, 2000. 2021. I just got out of a um, a Zoom session of Hawaii, and uh, yeah, so that's why uh, my uh, my accent mode was a, <laughs> a little bit different on that. It's Hawaiian. Yeah, because <laughs> um, they don't have th. Um, I mean, they have h, and I believe they they have t, but they don't combine it. Or something okay. like that. Uh, most of their words are um, doesn't have that sound. Is what I mean. Uh, but yeah, let's uh, move to our observance. So like, so we could see the three things that we are celebrating today, or observing, because you don't celebrate this. Uh, it's National Paper Airplane Day. And wow, so the observance of its own. Okay. Yes. Uh, actually. We did a we did a, a uh, what do you call this paper airplane a project back in Discovery at Stanton when we were all the way there. So for those of you guys who are part of us ever since that time, um, we did a paper airplane um, making contest where uh, you make a paper airplane with your staff and then uh, you hope for the best that when you throw it it goes the furthest and um, it was pretty funny because uh, making paper airplanes are all about following the instructions and folding precisely <laughs> and, that's hard to do <laughs> and that seemed to be hard to do uh, so most of the paper airplanes did weird things like instead of <laughs> flying forward it turned to the right or, or it did like a like a roller coaster loop de loop where it just goes back like <laughs> yeah so it was pretty funny and you guys like you guys pretty much enjoyed it even if you guys lost because you get to laugh at the weird paper airplane shenanigans that was going on um, but yeah um, I like paper airplanes ever since I was a kid uh, actually one of the so I told you guys before I when I was a kid I usually like. I don't go straight home after school. I would go to the library and read stuff because back then didn't have a computer. Uh, so the only way to learn new things is to actually open up a book. So I, I would open up a lot of books about origami back then when I was in like the fifth grade. And it showed me this one book showed me like so many different paper airplanes. It's if you're thinking about paper airplanes, it's not just the ones that you see on the picture right now. That's the that's the common one, right? I saw a paper airplane that doesn't look like an airplane. <laughs> yeah, there's I, I made one that looks like a bird. Uh, yeah, and then I, I also uh, remember how to make one that looks like the the stealth bomber. You know, the black. Uh, Does it did it fly? It does, all of these fly. It's not uh, or glide rather. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't there's only one paper airplane that I know how to make that doesn't fly and it looks like the ship from uh, Space Invaders the one at the bottom that goes left and right Oh, okay. yeah I, I I learned how to make that because I didn't want to waste paper and to make that paper airplane you just need a strip of paper and here's what happened most of origami things require you to have a square piece of paper so that means you have like an extra strip of paper excess right that you had to cut off to make a square paper because most papers is like a rectangle mm -hmm. so you cut off one part of it and you get a square paper for origami 
But then you have this strip of paper that I don't just want to throw it away because I don't want to waste paper. So I learned how to make this like tiny little ship out of uh, out of that one strip of paper. So that's the only one that doesn't fly. It's it's more of like a you know it's neat. I guess <laughs> if I was, it's more leaning towards the design. Than yeah. The <laughs> yeah, and I looked it up in the book because I was interested in the fact that I don't get to waste that strip of paper, you know. Uh, but yeah, um, if you want to observe today, then just make the paper per airplane uh, that you know how to make. Remember, I think following instruction is easy, but making it precise is, is harder yes. than I thought, you know. Yes, folding it precisely is very, very hard. You have to have steady hands and, you know, once you fold it, don't throw it away. Continue to, if you, once you fold it and you make a mistake, just continue so that you can see how, what, what weird thing it's going to do, you know? <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, uh, National Paper Airplane Day is today. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, National Blueberry Cheesecake Day. The, I think it's the most popular cheesecake flavor. Because what? After you have fun with your uh, paper plane. After or yes. After cheesecake. <laughs> Not during, because all the sticky stuff will get into the paper and it will make it fly weird. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, I, th I. This is not a fact. I just think that it is. It might be the most popular cheesecake flavor because. Whenever I think of a flavor, one of the most common, like if it's in an ice cream, then it's a blueberry cheesecake ice cream, right? It's mm -hmm. it's a common cheesecake flavor, so I guess it's the most popular. And yeah, that's a dessert that I do like. You that know what's I weird. Yeah. What? A lot. Of, I mean, you know, uh, cheesecake is very common here, right? Uh huh. But if you think about cheese ice cream, it's. I wouldn't say they're exactly the same, but there are major similarities. Um, but yeah, I guess people are finding cheese ice cream to be weird. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know why, because like, if you think about it, if you just stop to think about it a little bit, right? You would just like, okay, there's cheesecake, so that's cheese plus sweet plus dairy. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and cheese ice cream is basically cheese plus sweet plus dairy. Plus dairy cheese. Yeah. <laughs> So it's supposed to make sense if you think about it for a second, but our instincts kind of take us the other way because that's not something that is a common flavor ice cream here. Uh, the same uh, as, for example, when I first heard of dessert pizza. Oh yeah, <laughs> that one. I I was I was kind of like taken aback because like when you say the word pizza, my brain is automatically tomato sauce, right? Yeah. But a dessert pizza doesn't have tomato sauce. If you think about it in a, for a second, it actually makes sense because a dessert pizza is just bread, some some sort of filling. Yeah, the toppings are usually like Nutella, peanut butter, and some whatever. That's exactly what a sandwich, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is. <laughs> so it makes sense, except because our brains just automatically go, oh, pizza, tomato sauce. Yeah, that doesn't work in a dessert, but but just so you know, pizza, when they say dessert pizza, it doesn't have tomato sauce, it's just in the form of a pizza with the, um, what do you call this, with a flatbread, basically. Yeah. It's like an open-faced sandwich is what it is. <laughs> Alright, and our next one is also a dessert. So if you don't like blueberry cheesecake, then maybe you could have cherry cheesecake. Be what? Cheesecakes for today. Well, it's not cheesecake for this one. It's National Cherry Dessert Day. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember you can't see the top part of this, but um, for this one, it's not specifically cheesecake, but it has to specifically be cherry, and and a dessert. So cheesecake may be one of them because cheesecake is a dessert. Or if if you would like, like in the picture, it's a cherry tart. You could go with a cherry tart. Or maybe cherry ice cream, or maybe cherry candy. If you're like me, who can't eat a lot of sweets, just get a candy. That's that's good enough, because the candy is probably like two grams of sugar as long as you eat only one. So I could I could observe today by just getting um, a cherry candy of some sort. You know what, Joe and I talked about cherries for uh, for for some some of the episodes that we were making, and I keep telling him that uh, you know I. I, I I find myself in a weird spot where I would 
I, I love, personally, I love cherry flavored anything like drinks, ice cream, candies, and stuff, but I don't like cherry as a fruit for some reason. I, <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why. The cherry fruit, I, I hate it, but like cherry flavored candy, cher cherry flavored drink, or ice cream. So, I, so I, I love it for some reason. I don't know. It's weird. So, the, I, I know why because you haven't had real cherries before. Well, I did, and I didn't like it for some reason. Where, where, where did you get it? Uh, farmer's market, I would say. Uh, by the way, the first time I tried cherry was here too, when I got here. So you ate the actual fruit? I, I ate the actual fruit, yeah. Well, um, I, I couldn't, I won't be able to say I, I don't like it if I haven't No, I mean, I mean, because a lot of people don't like cherry because they think that cherry tastes like the thing that people put on top of like a, a shake or a whipped, cre whipped cream. Well, surprisingly, I haven't tried that cherry on top of an ice cream or something. Then you're probably gonna be gonna like that one, because oh, okay. because those are like it's like a different kind of cherry. It's it doesn't taste like what real cherries are. Really? Uh, yeah. So I, I would imagine that that cherry on top of the ice cream or float or whatever is more akin to the cherry flavor than cherries itself. So if you like cherry flavored, then I guess there you go. <laughs> Maybe I should give that a try, but yeah. I just find myself weird. I'm like, what's wrong with me? <laughs> hey, everybody Everybody has their quirks. <laughs> All right, today in history, we have a... Uh, so this picture is actually wide, very wide, but I have to fit it on our... Um, Format. So, so you're saying there's more people on the side. Yeah, and, and it it looks kind of weird because the the two people who are signing looks very far from each other. But it's really a wide. Yeah, because it's a wide picture, they're actually near each other. It's just you know I had to fit it here. You know. They, they kind of. They, I mean, I don't want to make fun of them, but uh, just as a joke, they kind of look like you know when you take your your, your quiz or your test. Yeah. <laughs> Making sure you don't see each other's answers. You you don't copy. Yeah. So, in 1972, the Soviet Union and the United States signed the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. So, um, this thing lasted from 1972 up to 2002. So, it actually doesn't is not in effect anymore. It's uh, 30, 30 years. Um, so, here's the thing. So, when the United States developed the nuclear weapons, the atomic bomb... Um, we're not the only ones who had it. Do we there we had some some people who who sold the information to the Soviet Union as well as their spies. So the Soviet Union was also able to create their own atomic bombs. The problem with atomic bombs is that if both nations go at war and they they um they ended up using it the whole planet is gone because of how powerful these things are. So the only reason why there aren't big wars anymore like World War One and World War Two, is because of the fact that if there is a World War Three, it's the end because of nuclear missiles, because of atomic bombs. So what happened was um, the treaty said that each party, which means the United States and the Soviet Union, each party will be limited to two um, anti-ballistic missile complex, uh, which uh, which is around a uh, hundred. Eventually, j just so that because it's more clear when you count how many exactly. So, started with two complexes, and then they and eventually said, okay, one hundred is the limit. And this is not one hundred atomic bombs. This is one hundred atomic bomb defenses so these are things that pinpoint the missile and then intercept it which means it stops atomic bombs the the reason why they kind of had a treaty of limiting the amount of defense is because if there's no limit on defense it's gonna just keep going up and up right like for example oh the united states has two defenses that means we need to make three atomic bombs 
And then the United States goes, oh, they have three atomic bombs? Well, let's make five for sure that we could stop all three, depending on where it comes from. Oh, the United States have five defenses? Well, we're going to make ten atomic bombs. Oh, they have ten atomic bombs? Let's make sure and let's go with ten defenses. Oh, they have ten defenses? It goes to fifteen. So it just keeps going on and on and on. So the treaty says if you limit the amount of defenses, then there will be no reason to keep making more and more and more and more because it costs money. Uh, it it will ruin the economy of the country if all they're doing is making bombs and making defenses. So they agreed to kind of limit. Um, however, in 2002, um, the USA, uh, I think under George W, um, withdrew from it because it decided that we ended up needed, needing to build more defenses because it's not just Soviet Russia, the uh, Soviet Union that has atomic bombs now. It's uh, rogue states, which means countries that dislike or hate the United States. And, you know, they have certain terrorist factions within their country that might uh, use that kind of thing. So George Bush said, OK, we need more defenses because we got caught off guard. Uh, in 9-11 and we're not as protected as we think we are so they withdrew from the treaty uh, but after withdrawing from the treaty there's a new treaty now called strategic offensive reductions which limits the amount of missiles deployed on certain locations so we're still not having a treaty that says we can't make uh, a certain number of atomic bombs because it's hard to police that when, when uh, these countries make atomic bombs, we keep it in secret, right? Mm -hmm. Even us, the citizens of the United States, we don't know how many we have. Only, only the top secret government positions know that. So you can't really police that. You can't really have a treaty with that because it's in secret. So instead, the new treaty just tells us you can't have more than this many in strategic relocations, uh, which means locations that are close to let's say washington dc you can't have that many close to washington dc or, or things like that we don't know what this what the strategy is the military knows that i don't want to pretend like i know what what is the tr strategic locations but that's the what the treaty says so yeah we are still hoping that um what you call the mutually assured destruction mad mm. that is the idea that if there's ever a war everybody just it will be miserable the threat that that can happen means no country will ever hope to create a world war three although we did get very close at some point in the past so i think it was during um the ronald reagan era it was so close the world war three was so close that the tanks were literally at the border pointing at each other but uh yeah it was so close but uh, this is why a lot of people like Ronald Reagan, but um, he he basically de-escalated that situation because no one wants no one wants to fight. It's just people fight because they have to. So he de-escalated that situation. The tank, the, the tanks actually the tank, the tanks actually backed up one by like little by little. Okay, we're gonna back up a couple of meters. Okay, now you tr okay you have to do it too. And then yeah, it was like. You know, so it's kind of like the uh, the movie equivalent of all right, I'm gonna put my gun down. You gotta put your gun down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something like that. Very, very slowly. Like they put their gun down very, very slowly. So we were so close to World War Three, but thankfully, uh, under good leadership of both, because it's also about I forgot which who's the leader of the Soviet well, Union. Yeah, I mean we're talking about two two sides. <laughs> it's not just it, one person. It might be Gorbachev, but don't quote me because my mind, my brain is getting fuzzy right now. There's too much information that my brain is just, I'm not a computer. So things are just, it might be in the back of my brain, but the leader, I'll just call him whoever the leader is of um, Russia during that time also did a good job. So even though they were the enemy during the Cold War, I don't want to discount the fact that they also agreed to back out because a truce is not a truce if not if both parties didn't agree so because ronald reagan did a good job and because the leader of russia did a good job that thing backed out completely 
takes two to tango, right? Yes. Uh, and for our notable person born on this day, uh, it is John Wayne in 1907. He does have an airport. Yes. <laughs> uh, he was also nicknamed Duke. Maybe that's where um, put up put up them Dukes came from. <laughs> I don't know where that oh, came yeah. from. Well, it could be right. Could be, but but his, I know that his other nickname is Duke. But either John Wayne or Duke was not his real name. His real name is Marion Robert Morrison. That was so far away from John. Yeah, there's no John anywhere. There's no letter J. Uh, <laughs> there's no Wayne anywhere. It's Robert. Uh, even Robert is like, yeah, there's. It's just Marion Robert Morrison. He was born in Winterset, Iowa, but he grew up mostly in uh, Southern California here. Uh, well known for his roles in Western movies. Uh, but while I do like the Western aesthetic, I just I didn't watch a lot of Western movies. Like I watch a few of the really really good ones, like The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. But I'm not familiar with many of his movies. Do you? Uh, no, not really. So that means we're gonna defer to you guys who are watching. Uh, put it on the comments below. What is your favorite John Wayne movies? Or even if it's not your favorite, if you know any movie that he uh, stars in, uh, that he features in. I know uh, we have one student who are like a very, very big fan of Western movies, you know? Yeah. So he might, he might know uh, a thing or two about John Wayne's movies. Yeah, so hopefully he could come and comment and put it down below because so, we could learn from you too. We're, we're not just the ones that are teaching. Sometimes you guys teach us. Mm -hmm. All right. Our dish of the day is from El Salvador. And luckily, there is a restaurant, El Salvadorian restaurant, near uh, our um, workplace at the site Discovery. It's just a block away. What and do do? Yes. Just one block away. Uh, towards north one block north um, and since I live next to our workplace I was able to ride my bike uh, to this place and I was able to get some food there so finally there's a um, a country where I could tell you directly what something tastes like rather than <laughs> guess from the ingredients uh, we have pupusa oh. So I have two actually because I was in the restaurant. I know that pupusa is the one that they are known for, so I got that. But there's also another dish that I was curious about, so I ordered that too. So for now, let's talk about pupusa. Um, this is made of cornmeal flour. So think of like a tortilla, but it's made with cornmeal flour instead of masa. So masa is more wet and cornmeal flour is more grainy. Okay. So um, you make this out of cornmeal flour, and in the inside there's a filling. So when you order a pupusa, you get to choose what filling uh, you want on the inside. Um, since I went to a traditional uh, El Salvadorian place, I went uh, the the stuff that, the the fillings they have in there are traditional. But I've seen it in like Food Network and some food shows that. There are some uh, creative um, food trucks that make pupusa, but the inside is like a hamburger patty with... Uh, oh. it's, it's like American. Instead of the bun, it's the pupusa flour. So so creative stuff, but I got the traditional one. So what's, the tra well, what's inside a traditional uh, pupusa? So they have something called revuelta, which is pork and cheese. I didn't get that one. I got... Oh, so meat. Yeah, meat. Uh, you could have vegetarian. One of them, it says calabasa, so it has pumpkin oh. inside. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Or if if you're if you're someone who just likes a quesadilla, then you can get the one with just cheese inside. So, um, the one that I got, uh, I got two flavors because I want to try different ones. I didn't want to get more because this is a lot of cornmeal flour. I I'm sure I'm gonna get full uh, if I eat this. So. Oh well, I mean, I, I'm sure the picture doesn't do justice, but how how uh, how, how big are the uh, these pupusas? If you know, um, I guess is it like about the size of your hand? Yeah, about the size of my hand. Okay. Not 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 when I fully stretch it out, like 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 that, like this. Okay, so it's uh, about this size. 
Yeah, it, it's kind of like a little bit bigger than the tortillas they use for like the mini tacos. Like a, a like if you buy a tortilla from the supermarket, the regular size tortilla. Yeah, it's about your hand, right? So it's kind of like a little bit. Oh, when it comes to just the diameter, would be a little bigger than a uh, Carl's Jr. burger. Yes, and it's and it's not thin like a tortilla. It's thick because you have it's to put thick. you have to put filling inside. Oh right, right. <laughs> yeah. So the fillings that I got was uh, chicken and cheese. So a pollo con queso is what it says on the menu. And then I got one that's called chicharron, but uh, it's not chicharron that is crispy pork. It's just their name for just pork. Okay. So, yeah, so here it is. Well, here's what comes with when you order it. Um, you could get like a preview of what the second one that I ordered in there. It, it looks kind of like a long thing. Uh, but um, they give you sauce in case you want it spicy because by itself it's not spicy. Oh, I like that. Yeah. So they give you the option to make it spicy on the side. Yeah, and then they give you pickled cabbage because, well, it's starch and meat. So if you needed, you need something fresh to go along with it to balance the meal, then you could have that pickled cabbage. Um, this is the inside, so right there. Uh, chicken and cheese, I really like. So if I go there and order this again, I'm gonna get chicken and cheese. The chicharron, the pork, was a little bit of dry. Because that's, I don't know, it's just, the pork tastes good, don't get me wrong. But it it felt like it's missing something, especially after I ate it after the chicken and cheese. It, it feels like this thing needs cheese. <laughs> so if you're gonna order any of these, I, I recommend either just the cheese, chicken and cheese, pork and cheese. Uh, I haven't tried the, the completely vegetarian one, like the calabasa one. But if you're gonna get the the ones with meat, I, I recommend getting it with cheese because it just adds a lot to it. Um, but yeah, I really like it. Uh, it's it's like it's like a better quesadilla. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's thicker and bigger. Yeah, it, it's like a cross between a quesadilla and an empanada, because the empanada is fried. This one is fried. not fried. Uh, but it's also stuffed and then you know but it's like it has a consistency of quesadilla so it's like a cross if you if you want if you if you're wondering what to eat and you're like I can't decide between a quesadilla and empanada well you can get a pupusa <laughs> all right the second one I got is a tamale and I was curious because the menu says specifically El Salvadorian tamale oh okay so I uh, at first glance with the picture, obviously different from the Mexican tamale because the Mexican tamale is wrapped in a corn husk. Which I actually like better because it creates this like lines. The you know, it's just aesthetic. It just makes it look cool with the with the lines. But they use banana leaf. Um actually I can't decide. I like the lines for aesthetic purposes. But the banana leaf adds flavor because banana leaf actually imparts flavor on um, on the tamale, and because it's a bigger leaf, you could completely wrap it and seal the juices inside. Mm -hmm. Not that the Mexican tamale is dry, but it's this one is wetter than the Mexican tamale because the Mexican tamale is in a corn husk, which you can't wrap completely; it evaporates a little bit. Yeah. So this one is a little bit more moist. And there's other things that are different other than just what it's wrapped with. Well, number one, it's a tamale, so it's still made of uh, corn uh, masa. Uh, but the key difference is what's inside. So you still choose whether you want chicken or pork, um, just like a Mexican tamale. Uh, but there seems to be a potato wedge inside if you look at what's on my fork. So it has a they they combine potato along with it which starch <laughs> yeah I, I i'm mixed feeling for me uh if you're not diabetic like me this is perfect because it it adds a different texture right so that's a positive however for me i don't want more starch <laughs> but there's also something in here that i don't like and it has green olives in there and oh. yeah, that, I'm not a fan of olives, but if you are, this is actually a very delicious. I could, 
I could um, differentiate between delicious and what I don't like. Because I live my life not liking cake, and that's what everybody loves. So, so I've learned to kind of find out what is just me personally not liking, and what is actually delicious and not delicious. So this, I guarantee you, is very delicious, but you have to like the olives. And number two, you have to not be diabetic like me and avert your eyes to more starch, you know? So if you are not either of those, I guarantee you this is very delicious because it's very moist and that is a very pleasing texture to it. Um, and of course, uh, for you, JR, the red stuff is not actually part of the tamale. That's me wanting it to be spicy, so I poured this. Uh -huh. I, I poured a whole cup of the spicy. Well, I'm I'm definitely the same as you. I'm not a big fan of olive myself. So. Yeah, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, you're not a fan of olive. But this is the tamale for you because it's not spicy. Uh, I literally have to pour the whole little container. <laughs> 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 Uh, so for me, I'm sticking with the Mexican tamale, but even then that's still a lot of starch So just on occasion, I will eat it on occasion, on occasion. There Yeah, you go. if you're a fan of olives though, I, I, I recommend this. This is very good uh, So this is the, pla the place that I went to uh, huh. It's uh, right in the middle. It says Nancy's Pupusari, Nancy's Pupusari. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right and this is the address if anyone is um, interested in taking a visit and trying it out or getting something for lunch maybe uh, for discovery staff uh, that's good for Joe. Joe Joe's being vegetarian they have a vegetarian pupusa the um, the calabasa one so that might work that might work out <laughs> well he, i don't know he's got specific days to uh, just last week he, he ate like three corn dogs oh yeah that's true <laughs> what <laughs> he's he's got like his vet quote unquote vegetarian is more of a mood <laughs> so so more of like you should eat properly rather than a diet and that's why I haven't really made fun of him i remember i used to make fun of him when he keep when he when he did like keto and, uh -huh. and my belief is that there shouldn't be any diets. You should balance, uh, depending on your body. Because like what is balanced for you, for example, is well, different. I mean, isn't that what the definition of diet is, is to make it balanced? Well, n yeah, the balanced diet. But but what I meant by diet is like, for example, Not at forcing yourself to do like to yeah. do something specific. Yeah, like Atkins or keto or things like that. It might work for some people, but because they're um, they have labels, they might end up being a fad, and some people ended up trying it even though it's not good for them or it doesn't work out for them. They're forcing their body, so you know I think the best is just to find the balance. Uh, I mean, I mean everything. We, we find things delicious because our body needs them, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that that's why you need to like be careful with that. Which I like what Joe's doing right now. He's, he's saying vegetarian, but actually what he's doing is he's trying to eat more vegetables. That's all he's doing. Yeah. And, that, and, and that's good because nowadays a lot of our food has a lot of just meat in it. And we're kind of off balance. So he's just trying to bring it back to the center. Uh, right. All right, animal of the day. Uh, we continue our Power Rangers. We now have the saber tooth tiger. <laughs> saber tooth tiger. <laughs> yeah, but um, in Power Rangers they call it the saber tooth tiger without the the hyphen and then without the ed in the end. But they're actually called saber toothed. Yeah, because it has tooth that looks like sabers. Um, I mean, they could also be, if I'm not mistaken, they could also be called just the saber tooth as far as, uh, like, the term is, it, it's specific for the cat, right? Oh. Yes. Uh, and, um, also, it has another name which is more scientific rather than Power ranger -y. Or not scientific, but it's more well-known as Smilodon. Because remember, Mastodon, we have a Smilodon. Um, and that's, I guess, because they have to smile because of their tooth. <laughs> if you're to the... Yeah, and it's called Smilodon because they have to smile if your teeth is getting in the way like that. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but yeah, uh, what's weird about this cat is they're not really closely related to ti the tiger or, oh, any, really? or any of our modern cats. Um, that's because this is, even though this, uh, if you could tell by the name, lived around the same time as the Mastodon. That means they didn't live at the same time as the T-Rex and the Triceratops. So, um, even though it, they're not that old, they are still extinct and pretty old. So, our tiger or modern cat has evolved into a like way different um, species at that point. They don't have very much similarity anymore, other than what they look like. I can look at picture and I can I can tell if this animal has a tail or or not. Yeah. You know, like the right there doesn't kind of doesn't kind of show any any. Uh, bumps, if, if you know, like exactly, oh, it's, maybe it's just the picture. Maybe the picture, I'm not sure actually. But the thing is, they lived the same area as not only the same time, but they lived in the same area as the mastodon. Although the mastodon was mostly in North America, the smilodon was all across America. So some of them shared land with mastodon, some of them are all the way south because uh, the first fossils that were found of uh, Smilodon was in Brazil so but yeah um, actually this picture depicts what they look like but one thing that is not true or might not be true about the picture is their fur because we're not gonna be yeah obviously right we can't tell what the color or patterns they have on their fur from bones <laughs> We, it, that's hard to tell. Bones, we could tell what they look like because we kind of jigsaw puzzle it together. The archaeologist who knows how bones supposed to fit together. Mm -hmm. They just do that and then, okay, it looks like this. Oh, but that's why other researchers also think that dinosaurs, especially like, you know, like, like for T-Rex and other famous ones, may not have any, like, scaly surface. Uh, I mean, like, some other researchers are thinking they might have like feathers or something yeah you you don't you don't other times. you don't know that and the, the reason why we are um spe what the reason why the scientists are speculating this and that is because of the likelihood like for example right. what if, if everything is so big and you need protection from getting eaten what is the likelihood animal trait that would something would have the scales right scales, that's that's yeah. why they they're speculating that but there are some scientists that say well if the bird is the modern dinosaur because all the dinosaurs the only survival survivors of dinosaurs are birds because when when the when the meteor land guess who fly. yeah guess who's safe the ones who could fly so so that's why they are thinking that maybe the reason why birds have feathers is because um, what do you call this? Because dinosaurs also had feathers and stuff like that. So we're not sure, uh, but we, we're, we have very good intelligent guesses is what's going on because of very smart people. Educated guesses too, yeah, from what yeah. we learned. However, the pattern of your fur is something that you can't really be sure of. This is their guess, they're just that color because the pattern of your fur could correspond to what the landscape looks like, right? So you see the landscape is very yellowish. Then I guess the fur would be yellowish so you could hide, you know, things right, like that. Right. Camouflage. But they're not sure because we're not sure whether... Because there are animals who don't really care about camouflage. For example, the tiger is in a forest which is all green and then you have this cat that is... That is like... It's like if someone was a crossing guard, they're wearing that bright orange jacket <laughs> so you're not really hiding right you're trying to be you're seen presenting yourself to be a dinner. <laughs> yeah exactly so that's why we're not sure either we don't know whether they're using their fur as a camouflage or maybe they're like a tiger where they just don't care they just want to look fabulous you know <laughs> all right plan of the day i'm running out of plants <laughs> we have uh we had olives already Man, uh, imagine getting a plant from Jurassic times. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know much about those. So <laughs> we have chile de arbol, uh, which Ooh. which is Spanish of tree chili, like the tree, arbol. 
That's why we have Arbor Day as trees. Uh, a small but potent Mexican chili used in a lot of uh, different red salsas. So a lot of the salsas that you get when you order Mexican tacos will be made with chili de arbol. Um, sometimes called bird's beak chili because of how small they are. They just looks like a beak of a bird. Right. Or sometimes they're called rat's tail chili because there are some long ones. Like if you let it grow for a, a while, like for example, it okay. for, yeah, for example, this one. So it looks like a rat's tail. Yeah. Yeah. But that's still chili de arbol, and it it looks like that because of the 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 crown of it. It's very um. It doesn't grow on a tree like a tree that's tall. Like, that's why it's called chili de arbol. It's called like that because of the crown, the little green part at the top of the chili. It's very um. What do you call this? Tree looking. Not tree looking. The texture of a tree. Woody. Oh, okay. It's very woody. woody. There you go. Yeah, the, 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 the little stem is very woody. So they just called it uh, tree chili. Um, and yeah, that's that's the chili that you'd likely be... You already know what it tastes like because it's a part of many salsas. But one thing uh, that I could tell, t tell you about chilies is that usually the smaller they are, the more... <laughs> The more, the more potent, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> small, small but terrible. Tiny but spicy. Yep. Uh, all right, we're continuing art of the day with Quentin Hoover, the guy that uh, draws comic book like um, art. But as you saw with last week, it's not just always comic book art. Uh, he's a good artist, so he has many different styles under his belt. And one of the styles last week was. It looks like a paper layer painting. Mm -hmm. uh, today, we have Amru's Scout by Quinton Hoover. And uh, let's take a look closely. Here we go. So it, this one is still comic book-like in a sense. However, it's not old comic book. This is modern comic book where there's a lot of like gritty details. Yeah, with less outline too, by the way. Exactly. So, so combine it with... Uh, not combine it. Like, think of this... Uh, think of his usual style as, like, the comic books from the 80s where mm -hmm. Spider-Man, the first issue, or Batman, the first issue. But he also knows how to make the comic book from modern day eras like today where it doesn't have clear, distinct lines. But it also doesn't look realistic at the same time it has all the details that a realistic picture would have but it still looks very fantasy like rather than right. you know real uh excuse me <laughs> <coughs> at the sneeze <laughs> bless you i think it's more of a uh well yeah comic book or graphic novel like the modern oh, yeah gra novel. modern graphic novel is uh, i guess the best way to say so uh, that's another um, style under his belt and you know I like to show these first until and then next week we're gonna show you the best so I, I showed you his iconic one the wrath of God I showed you one that is different in style and another one that is different in style and then finally next week I'm gonna show you one that um, it's not in an iconic card but one of my favorite um, of his art because of Look, I mean, this one is interesting, but this, the card that it comes from isn't actually very good either. So you know what? Just, just comparing, uh, you know, like like him as a as a specific kind of artist compared to other, uh, I would say, like uh, Japanese artists, right? You know, when they draw, especially their manga, uh, their manga, by the way, uh, mm -hmm. their comic books, their country, they have a specific pattern, and you would know, like, if you see a character, you would kind of like, oh, if you. This character is drawn by this because that's, you know, by this artist because that's what their, their uh, art style. Or, yeah, for know. for distinct ones, like for example, Dragon Ball, has yeah, a, yeah. a has a I, very distinct ones. Right. But nowadays, um, a lot of uh, manga and art, anime are done by several people, so instead of distinguishing it by the name of the person, it's usually distinguished by the name of the company. Yeah, now it's by the company yeah. because they have. These, I mean, not not specifically this person, but they have uh, like artists similar to this person who 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 could, you know, who uh, how can I say, like 
they're flexible. Like, oh, you want this kind of style? I can do it. You know. I, I'm sure the manga artists are also flexible, but the problem is, like, not because it does sound like it's a downside that they're not flexible, but we we actually don't know because the thing about manga and anime is you have to make a lot of them. Like, you have to draw a lot, oh, yeah, that's right? True, that's true. Or not only a lot, so it's better if you stick to a certain style so you could just... It's kind of like me when I fold clothes. I have a specific way I fold clothes so I could do it fast, right? Yeah. Um, there's another reason is because if you're, for example, doing episode 1 of an anime, if episode 2 somehow <laughs> looks different, it's weird. <laughs> yeah. As opposed to these artists from Magic the Gathering Cards, they do have iconic arts. Like, for example, like I said, his iconic art is the comic book style. Most of when it when you say Quentin Hoover at the bottom of the card, most of the the pictures will look like that style, the comic book, the 80s comic book. However, they have the freedom to just, you know what? I feel like doing this today. They have that freedom, at least All back right. then. Yeah, because the the cards are very separate. They don't come in the same, you know. They they're encouraged to be different from the get-go. Uh, that's why I, I, I've mentioned before, I don't like how they're telling the artists how to draw things nowadays. Because that that's what they're doing. Because you know how anime has oh, to be the same. It, it became like a, like a, what do you call this, like a musical industry now too. It's like, yeah. Oh, this is so you gotta make a song with this melody or something. Oh. Yeah, so, and the reason for that is because the same thing as, comic, uh, as manga and um, anime. There has to be a certain identity on the style. So there has to be a certain identity on what the cards look like whenever they come out with a new set. Because that whole set has a story that is just that in that set, right? Alright, that's reasonable. I think that's reasonable. It is reasonable. However, I prefer it back then when they just told the artist, whatever. Because it's more imaginative, right? I don't, I don't actually like the fact that we are being fed a certain... Thing now whenever we consume any sort of entertainment no but like like an example would be uh, a set like Kamigawa set if I remember it correctly like yeah. all, all the drawings and art is kind of uh, uh, you know it has a touch of no, like, feudal I, Japan style actually so actually in Kamigawa um, they there were still kind there were still very different distinct styles they're all oh, they're all Japanese in theme but like for example, how would Quinton Hoover's comic book style translate to Japanese theme? How would this guy that uses digital software to paint translate to Japanese theme? Yeah. So those are how it was before, and that's when you played, actually. Uh, so uh -huh. you, you haven't. That was a long time ago. Yeah, a long time ago. Nowadays, the cards look very samey, as in they won't tell them that okay, this is the theme for the set. They would they would say like, oh, it has to be like. A certain color tone for this and a certain you know oh, yeah okay. there are still artists who are who are given the chance to create their own stuff but they they put those in cards that uh, are being sold for so more rare. special di special editions <laughs> like, like for example a regular booster pack of Magic the Gathering is like four dollars right this special edition booster pack, I kid you not, there's one that is like $10 each, and there's one that's $100 each. What? Yeah, they're really milking people because they knew that people love the creativity of the artist. So they would sell those cards. And I, 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 I wish the backlash doesn't go to or it doesn't get directed to the artist because they just... No, you know, they were no. Thank, thankfully, the artists are, are well-respected. Okay. Uh, still, because because they don't. Whenever they get commissioned by the company to draw an art, they don't tell them where it goes. They just tell them this is what we want. This is what they don't even know what the card actually does yet. They just give them a gist, right? So, for example, with Amru Scout, they probably were like, okay, so we need a scout that's self-defining uh, from Amru, and Amru is this dark place that is very it's like a desert but with white sand and um, perpetual twilight or something like that and of course Quinton's like okay so he made like a desert landscape as you can see that is not bright orange glowing it's like dark desert landscape with with a lot of like you see how there's a lot of like glow 
around her. Mm -hmm. That's the sand. Because remember, that that's how creative artists are. Like, if you were told you need to draw sand, you need to draw a desert, you wouldn't think of doing this like little wispy stuff around the, the character, right? Because, well, because you're not an artist. An artist has this like vision, it's like, oh yeah, there's sand. And sand doesn't just stay in one place. There's wind, it just goes everywhere. So yeah. so he, he made this wispy stuff around the character. So that's like the great thing about artists. Like, so, and, and I always hate it when people say that, oh, you... Like, like whenever I, I've seen like websites where it, the artists would like show this person that think that drawing is easy so that they should draw draw for free like i sure <laughs> so yeah uh but um next week we're gonna find more of his uh, art that, and he's he's not an artist that i i find often anymore because like i said his style doesn't fit the new um the new requirements, requirements yeah if he pops up it's because they commissioned him to do something for a special card. <laughs> oh. All right, word of the day. We have Mujiks. Mujiks. So it is a Russian peasant and it has alternative spellings. You could spell it, uh, well, first of all, it's spelled M U Z J I K S. And you could spell it without the J, but instead of an H. So M U Z H I K S, or um, a more Atlantis one, uh, M O U J I K S. So Mujiks, Mujiks. And uh, this is not something that you probably would be able to use, but it's one. It's a spelling that, or it's a word that has a history in Scrabble. So an M is three. Uh, the U and I are ones because they're vowel. Mm -hmm. The letter Z is ten. ten. The, the letter J is right? eight. Oh, it's eight. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, and the letter S is one because it's common, and the letter K is five. So total of that is twenty-nine points. Okay. Now, this is historic because this is the. Um, this is a word that Jesse Inman, you might not know him, but because it's about Scrabble and it's not widely televised, but he earned the record of the highest scoring opening word ever played in 2008 with this word. And the points is not just 29, because it's the highest scoring, right? So, first things first. We well, said opening, so he's the first one to uh, put that word? Yeah, so he, he, he got the first. He, he got the first turn, and then this is the word that he put down. Now, if you put this word as a first word, you could align it so that the letter Z lands on a double letter score. Okay. So instead of 29, this is actually a 39. Not only that, the very center of the Scrabble board has a star. And it's the same color as a double word score because it is. So you oh, have yeah. So the first word is always double. Uh, so instead of thirty nine, it's actually seventy eight. So well, I, I didn't know that star has any value. It yeah, has a value. The first one is double, because the the reason for that is because you have to create a word on your own without the help of any other letters that are already out there. So right. they they gave you the double word score for that, and on top of that. You're giving the chance for your opponents to connect to it. And and the way that the, the Scrabble board is is laid out, when you put a when you put a word and then the next word you put is uh, perpendicular to it, it, it will hit one of the the special um, the additional points. Yeah. So it's not actually a very big um, lead. Uh, it's kinda like if you're playing a card game and then you get to go first. Sometimes it's actually not good to go first because you you kind of play a card and they will know what's going on. Uh, so they let you draw a card if you're going first. So it's kind of like that. Now, I said 78, right? But if you but if you count the number of letters, that's all 7. That means he also bingoed 
use your all yeah right yeah so that means he earned a total of 128 points in his first word <laughs> yeah so likely you're not gonna get this because you know it let it needs a, a letter z which is there's only one of um and, and you have to have it at the very start so likely it's not gonna happen but it has a historical significance to it because I mean, it, that requires skill too. You might have this word, and it, but if you didn't know, then you wouldn't have you wouldn't have used it, right? So it's all it's not only luck, but it's also his skill of the game. And on top of that, that it's the, the spelling that I put on top is actually the alternate spelling, because well, actually all of these are alternate spellings because the the real spelling of Mujiks uses uses the Russian word, the Russian letters, right? So there's no real spelling of this word. It's just all of these, and you have to know before you use it. <laughs> all right, finally, food fact to the day. We already talked about this at some point uh, during our. Um, I think I don't know what brought it on, but. Yeah. yeah, you. But uh, the candy bar Three Musketeers originally had three flavors. This is for you guys who are, aren't able to attend Zoom. I know some of you guys are uh, watching every day, but don't. I don't see you guys on Zoom. So the the candy bar Three Musketeers originally had three flavors: the Neapolitan, strawberry, van, uh, uh, strawberry vanilla, and chocolate, one piece each. Now, what what the reason why I put this here is because for those of you guys who were went on Zoom, there's a fact that I. I didn't say because I didn't know until I researched it. Um, I only guessed, like I, I, I told you guys, like why? I, I guess, I guess they removed the other flavors because, kind of like how many people when they have Neapolitan ice cream, they eat the chocolate but they leave the other two behind. Uh, that yeah, was like. I, I think that one. I mean, there's a reason why the, the ice cream is divided uh, vertically. So yeah, you can try all flavors. but they don't. Like I, whenever I eat that, I always scoop across, so you get like all three. I, I thought that was supposed to be. I, I, yeah. The, I mean, I guess for me, who likes to try everything, that's a thing. <laughs> uh, but that's actually not the reason. That was just my guess. The real reason why it's now just the chocolate is because um, in World War Two, there, of course, in World Wars, there are food sh shortages. Mm -hmm. And because there's food shortages and rations, um, they had to minimize. They had to cut down. So what they did is they removed the less popular flavors. I mean, <laughs> so so they only had chocolate. Because of course, even though like we're at war, chocolate, even though it's not a nutritious food, it keeps your morale up. Actually, they sent. That's how Hershey's bar got popular. They sent chocolate bars to the soldiers during I, during war, and when the war was over, they came home. And you're like, you know what I'm craving. <laughs> <laughs> so now that the war is over, Hershey's now has a bunch of people who crave the chocolate that they've been sending, and money, money, money. <laughs> Alright, and that is it for our show today. Hope you guys learned something. Uh, not going to add any more to the end of this because we have, uh, I think, went past the time. So we'll see you guys next time. See ya.